thank you so much, guys. Um, we've been going through a parable series lately. Today we're going to look at lesson eight of the Jesus's parables. Uh, we're learning quite a lot with Jesus's parables. We're learning so much about how he loves to use quite extraordinary examples to illustrate spiritual principles in his word. Uh, I love the one where he's got the plank out of his own eye, um, you know, because you're seeing a speck in your brother's own eye. Uh, we're, we're learning so much about the parables of Jesus. Amen. And today we're looking at uh, specifically the parables about the kingdom of God, which is very, very exciting. Um, I've entitled the lesson, The Greatest Garden in the World. Oh. And uh, it, it, it really, really excites me, um, you know, to get inspired with the lesson. I, I went and, you know, researched a lot about gardens and went and saw a few gardens myself. It's reminded me of uh, my mother's gardens too, uh, that she constructed and planted during COVID. Uh, you know, for many of us, we were isolated and there was not much for her to do. In, uh, instead, she just decided to make a garden outside. And now it's a very, very flourishing garden. And my dad loves to say that there are a lot of beautiful gardens, a lot of beautiful flowers in my mother's garden. Um, and they're beautiful and great. However, they're quite useless. <laughs> they're just beautiful. However, in the garden, there are also plants that bear fruits. Like watermelons, lemons, mandarins, all sorts of herbs and spices. And they're the useless ones. Uh, sorry, they're the good ones, right? They're actually, you can use it for uh, cooking and stuff like that add a bit of spice, and it's actually very useful. My dad's a chef, so he really appreciates that. Yes. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 to 18, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Fruits. So I've sent the lesson notes out to everybody. If you don't have them, just nudge the person right next to you to send them to you. Uh, but we're going through the, uh, the parables uh, of the growing seed, the mustard seed, as well as the yeast. God is the greatest gardener and he's planting his kingdom on earth. John chapter 15 verse 1 to 2 says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. An apple tree, it bears apples, does it not? And in the same way, a Christian bears Christians, does it not? If a Christian is not bearing Christians, then there's something wrong. Just like how an apple tree does not bear apples, then there's something wrong with that tree. Eventually, you get sick of it and you're like, I'm just going to cut it off because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. You know, some gardens in the world are really, really awesome. There's a, the Garden of the Versailles in France, and that housed many, many kings of France. It took 40 years to construct, and it's a masterpiece to really, really behold. And then there are some memorial kind of gardens. Uh, Fang and I, we on our day, uh, day off on Friday, we went to Willoughby, uh, we went to Chatswood. Uh, and there was a Willoughby City Council Memorial Park there. And what the purpose of that garden was to basically honour those who came from Willoughby City Council in the north uh, and to honour those that went to war and died so that we can have today. What kind of garden is God trying to create? What kind of garden and plant is He trying to plant and grow? You know, today we're going to look at how the kingdom of God grows through these different parables. And the first point that I have is with natural power. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29, He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. So we know that Jesus loves to use analogies and parables to illustrate these spiritual principles. He loves to use this uh, parable that consisted of a farmer, consisted of a man, 
and he was just sowing seed, sowing seed, and sowing seed. He doesn't get up some days, some days he does get up and he works on them. Whether or not he does, it doesn't matter because God is the one that is making it grow. Yeah. Yeah. It says that, uh, he says that uh, there is, you know, it starts with the seed, it grows, uh, starts, it produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grape is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. You know, we use lots of analogies in our Bible studies to help people understand what it's like to be in the kingdom, what it's like to be a Christian and stuff like that. And uh, Jesus, he uses this farming analogy because people were farmers back in the day. Today, we have similar relevant uh, analogies to help us understand. So for those that are, you know, like to sit on their computer, and work on their computers at home because it's isolation and COVID and stuff like that. You might have like a, a meal that you eat in front of your desk, right? And it's because you're working and you're eating, you're working, you're eating, you love to put on YouTube, put some movies and watch while you eat as well as work. And over time, you actually uh, you know, forget about the bowl that you left next to your table. And then the next day comes, the next day comes, and the next day comes, and it's just sitting there. And eventually, you're like, you're looking at it, you're looking at it, and you're too lazy to actually put it back in the kitchen to actually have it cleaned up. And you just leave it until it starts growing mold. And gets moldier and moldier and moldier. I used to do that when I was, uh, when I was younger. And my parents would used to say that, what are you doing, Aaron? Are you trying to conduct a scientific experiment? <laughs> and in the same way, you know, the mold, it naturally grows. We naturally grows. It naturally grows. Even though we do nothing about it and putting it into kitchen, it still grows without us dealing with it. In the same way, um, the kingdom of God is like that. It grows and grows and grows whether or not you are doing anything about it. You can be in the kingdom, in the church, um, and be doing absolutely nothing but you see victories and baptisms and people becoming Christians left, right and center. And you get convicted yourself and, and you become shameful. Like, what am I doing about my life? What am I doing about my Christian life? Well, it's time to change and get on with the process, right? Um, I, I think about, um, I think about uh, uh, weeds, for example. Weeds in the same way, they're just on our balcony and they just grow by itself. You cut it off, it keeps growing. You cut it off, you keep growing. Even if you pull it from the roots, some way, somehow, it just keeps growing. Yeah. Right. You know, weeds don't need encouragement to grow. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> but, uh, you, know, we're in the, you know, we. But a lot of us, we need a bit of encouragement to grow, don't we? But uh, it's actually the Word of God that helps us to grow. Amen. You know, a man scatters the seed on the ground. This is the Christian sharing his faith, obviously. He's spreading the Word. He's preaching the Word. He's evangelizing. He's doing Bible discussions in his home. And he's leaving some uh, quite convicting scriptures to really imprint on people's hearts. A Christian who doesn't share their faith is like someone who's working at Subway but doesn't make Subway sandwiches. Um, you know, it's someone who is... Uh, uh, a cook, but doesn't actually cook. Um, it's the job of a Christian to tell other people about Jesus. If you love soccer, then it's a striker who doesn't score his goals. That's what a striker is supposed to do. That's his job. He needs to score goals to win for the team. Therefore, how important is it for a Christian to share their faith every single day? Um, Brian and I, we've uh, 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 gotten into this habit of evangelizing right before Bible discussion. And uh, it's been very, very successful. Uh, we've, met, we've been able to meet a, a friend of ours, and uh, he just simply said, I'm coming straight away. Um, you, know, you, you know, sometimes you invite someone and they say they come, but you don't actually expect them to come. He actually came and, uh, and uh, started to come to Bible discussion. He went to the Batman service and had a real impact in his life. However, he was taken away with exams and assessments because at the at University of New South Wales, they're going through exams at the moment. 
And it really took him out from wanting to study the Bible and wanting to study the Bible and wanting to study the Bible. However, a few bit of a persistence and following up with him, he eventually came back and he was so impacted by Brian's Bible discussion on the Great Banquet that he said to us that he's basically every single one of those guys there <laughs> in the Great Banquet that said no, no, no. And he was really impacted. We did a Bible discussion, a Bible study on Seeking God with him straight away. And, uh, and he was able to leave feeling like, wow, like, you know, seeking God uh, with my whole heart, I know that that's something I've got to work on and work on and work on because I find it a challenge to do now. So he's been able to go and do that and try to figure himself out and wrestle with the scriptures uh, to, to really seek God with his whole heart. You know, whether a man sleeps or gets up, you know, this means whether you are a Christian or not, God's kingdom will grow with or without you. The gospel is bearing fruit throughout the whole world, whether you are on board or not. The kingdom grows not because of us, but in spite of us. So it doesn't matter how great you are. It doesn't matter how great your Bible discussion is. The job that you have as a Christian is just to get the word of God out yeah. there. You know, sure enough, you know, you are able to grow in your skills and grow in how to use the word as the word is uh, like a double-edged sword. And the better you are at using a double-edged sword, the better you are at attacking the enemy and actually being effective with it. But, you, but in the end, you've still got a sword. You've yeah. still got a sword. And uh, when people see you with a sword, they're quite intimidated with you, aren't they? They're quite intimidated with you. And so, you know, it's so encouraging to be part of the movement. Um, I think about uh, the fact that we get to go, at the, go to the GLC in August this year, the Global <laughs> Leadership Conference. Uh, and uh, it's just so inspiring because uh, the first time that I got to go to a GLC, which is about three years ago, it was the first experience that I ever got of the kingdom at large. All around the world, leaders are coming to, to Los Angeles to join us with the conference. And the singing just is so electrifying that it feels like you're in heaven. Wow. It just makes you feel like you're in heaven with all the angels singing. And, you know, there's beginning for just four, uh, less than 40 disciples over about 16 years ago. It has grown to 128 family of churches today in 52 different nations with 9,956 disciples. And this year we're praying that 22 church plantings will be established. Are you on board with the kingdom? Are you keeping in step with what the Spirit wants to do in your life, in the movement, and in the lives around you? You know, He puts a sickle to it when it's ripe. You know, that's basically like a, Christ, uh, like a non-Christian who's ready to study the Bible and become a Christian. Uh, it, it's, it's, we have an expression in the church. It's like, it's not our job to open people up. It's actually God's job to open people up. We're just there to mop up the pieces. You know, and I think about just the examples of really open people that have been in my life and, and have converted as in the process. I think about myself. I think about how... When I became, when I first started studying the Bible, I actually wanted to read the Bible for myself. I wanted to, uh, I started reading Genesis, but when I was reading Genesis, it got, it got quite a bit and quite overwhelming because when you pick up a Bible as a non-Christian, it can feel quite intimidating, can't it? The, 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 the pages are quite thin and the words are a little bit small and you're like trying to, what is God trying to say here? But three days later, after I put my Bible down on my bookshelf and said, oh, I'm going to get back to it later. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Someone actually reached out to me to invite me to a Bible discussion to study the Bible. And I was like, well, this, this is either a coincidence or, I mean, God is really, really real and he's trying to knock on my door. Wow. You know, maybe he's done that to you today. Yeah. Maybe you've been trying to read the Bible and seek God. And as a result, you've been invited to a Bible discussion. Now you're at church and God is really opening your heart. I, I think about uh, at that time, I, I could have easily not wanted, it, wanted to do it. Um, easily, easily, easily. And, you know, at that time, there was a lot of things that happened that put me in that process of like wanting to seek God. I was reading a lot of books at that time. When I was growing up, I hated reading. I really, really hated it. But at that time, I was trying to uh, 
you know, I was trying to grow myself, I was trying to motivate myself, so I was reading lots of books. But I always believed that the Bible was the most influential, most published, most translated book in the world. And if I'm learning from all these different people in the world, should I not be learning from Jesus himself? And so as a result, I really wanted to get into the Bible. Uh, I was talking to Brian just yesterday. And uh, Brian has a really, really amazing story of how he became a Christian. He got reached out to a... Uh, a big white guy as well as a, a big African-American guy and uh, he's just a Taiwanese guy you know in America you know trying to trying to live his life and two people that he would normally not associate himself with um, not because he's racist but you know I, I can understand that you know but pe- two people that he might not associate with help himself with actually reached out to him to study the Bible he studied the Bible However, he couldn't get his heart around really being a Christian, really doing what a Christian does. And so he left them after seven months. He got invited to a party where they were smoking weed. And he had this trip that was so incredibly bad that he felt like he was in hell and it was game over for him. He called up the brothers to have him baptized the next day because he was so impacted by that trip that he was like, you know what, I have to get baptized. And after hearing it, he actually told me that during that week, the brothers actually prayed for him. Prayed for him the very week that he actually had that trip and called him the, uh, the, the next day up. Prayer really, really works. Whether you believe it or not, it really, really works. And so what is your prayer life like? Are you constantly praying for the lost? Are you praying for your family? Are you praying for the Christians in the church? You know, are you praying for the people that used to study the Bible with you but have completely gone astray and gone and done something else? I know that, uh, you know, uh, we're so culprit of that. We can just study the Bible with people and we're like, you know, we're not going to think about them or pray about them. But it's actually the people that are in our contacts that we've met before that we've reached out to to, uh, to actually study the Bible and actually have studied the Bible that we've got to pray for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about um, uh, I, I think about my wife as well. My wife is amazing. She's incredible. And uh, at that time when she was uh, before when she was actually in Boston, she was um, very very open to uh, you know coming to church and stuff like that. She she was hurt a little bit you know with uh, some other false churches out there. But she saw disciples that were just preaching the word on a, a walkway and she just was with her she was with her skateboard and she just went up to them and just said hey what are you guys doing i want to join you guys and they were just preaching boldly you know there was like a young prophets young leader kind of group and she just went straight to them i'm joining you guys they started studying the bible with her and as a result she's here thank god yeah. <laughs> as a christian in my mind but uh you know but it's, it was all God that was working behind the scenes, working in her heart to help her to see that. It was all God, you know, answering the brother's prayer with Brian to help him. To, maybe God was the one that actually gave him that bad trip. I don't know. It was all God behind my, in, in my life to make sure that I was at a point where I was the most open to actually study the Bible. And so with natural power... God grows his kingdom. Point two, with supernatural power. Supernatural power. Oh, baby, I love this one. Mark chapter 4, verse 30 to 32 says, Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the uh, birds can perch in its shade. And so uh, Jesus again uses a a very relevant analogy. Why does he use the mustard seed? Well, maybe it's because the farmers uh, used it very, very regularly. It may not be the smallest seed on the whole entire world, but it definitely was the smallest seed that the Jews understood as. You know, he uses the mustard seed. Why? Because not only does it grow into a a, a plant, but it, it doesn't actually grow into the biggest plant in the garden. And so for it to grow into the largest plant in the garden, it really requires something unusual or supernatural to happen in order for in order for this to happen you know it's also a seed that is densely packed with thousands of other seeds 
so that it can actually spread to other soils. And that's what Christians does, does. Christians have many, many seeds. In other words, the more and more you know your Bible, the more and more it will project out to everybody else. You know, it's also virtually indestructible by fire. You know, and as the Bible says, as Christians, we are refined in the fire. Amen. We are refined so that our faith may be proven genuine. And it can grow with or without the attention of the farmer as well. You know, in other words, maybe your discipler sinfully and uh, neglectfully is not having discipling times with you. However, there's no excuse for not growing. No. There is no excuse. You still have the Bible. You still have your quiet time. You can still have your God to go and pray to and grow into an incredible instrument that God can use. Yeah. With or without your discipler. Okay, so that... That's good for me, in, 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 my, in case I'm in sin. All right, so Jesus referred to the mustard seed in various ways. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So, uh, um, you know, it, it's been very, very exciting to go to the Taiwan mission team with my wife and Brian Mildred. It's been very, very exciting. And uh, we've been having Taiwan mission team meetings uh, for the past few months now. And I, I, I get the opportunity to preach to people, to, to really inspire them to come and join us on a mission team. And so as a result of that, there's a few people like Benjamin in Sao Paulo uh, who's going to join us. Uh, as well as uh, Jeremy uh, Beck, as well as his family, that have been very, very encouraged to come and join us for the mission team. Uh, and he's from Hawaii. He used to be in this uh, church here. But, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, because of the, um, the border restrictions, Taiwan is actually not allowing mainland, uh, mainlanders like my wife to actually go into the country. And as a result, I can't, we can't go. Um, however, we're taking that as God saying we're not ready yet for any particular reason. And uh, he's got the perfect time for us to send us at his timing. But the interesting thing is, I'm trying to get my point right. <laughs> um, the interesting is, um, uh, I've completely lost my point. It will come back to me. Amen. So Luke chapter 17, uh, verse 17, it says, He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey. Okay, I remembered it now. You've got to go back to the scripture. You've got to go back to the scripture. Remember it. Okay. So uh, the mountains, it means kingdoms of the world. It means nations. It means countries of the world. And so Jesus is trying to say, guys, you guys have, if you just have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell this nation to go and uproot itself or come out of its roots and go into the sea. In other words, get baptized. Baptizing nations. And you know, as I said, it's so encouraging to go to uh, Taiwan and be chosen to go to Taiwan. But unfortunately, we can't go. Amen. But uh, the thing is, like, in, in, you know, I've been praying for, uh, for, for, for something impossible to happen. Because in Taiwan, it used to be called uh, Taiwan, the place of miracles, right? So I'm like praying for a miracle. God, please make a miracle. Please make a miracle. Uh, so I was just talking to Brian one day. And I was like, Brian, you know, what is Taiwan going, uh, in order for Taiwan to allow Chinese mainlanders to actually come into the country, what needs to happen? And Brian said, well, if China declares Taiwan as an independent nation, then maybe they'll actually allow Chinese people to go. And I was like, you figured it out. I'm going to start praying for China to declare Taiwan as an independent nation. And I started praying for that. And I've started praying for that a few, uh, for, for a number of weeks now. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a faith as small as a mustard seed. Yeah. Do I really believe that could happen? Well, it could happen because yeah. God's in control of all the nations. Yeah. But it just requires us to have a faith as small as a mustard seed. And that's all it requires. So are you praying for those impossible prayers? Yeah. That is a real impossible prayer. We can have no control over that whatsoever. What are your impossible prayers? You know, I think about someone who has uh, grown from a mustard seed of faith. Um, I, I think about uh, uh, Marin, for instance. Oh boy, it took a long time for him to come to church. However, he's joining Joe's YP groups and it's very encouraging to, for him to, you know, have this 
spiritual ambition to actually do something great for God and to go and plant a church somewhere in China. Yes. Yeah, Beijing, right? You know, the, the belly of the dragon. All right. You know, it's so, it's so awesome to see uh, Keanu dating as well with Beth. So awesome. I, I remember studying the Bible with him at that time before he was a non-Christian. He had, he had this relationship with this girl and it wasn't very pure and godly. And I was like, mate, God's going to give you a more incredible girlfriend, all right? And, he, you know, he heard that and, and he's a real, real, he, he's a faithful guy. He was like, you know what? I'm just going to drop it so that I can become a Christian and be right with God. Yeah. That is seed as small as a, mu- uh, a mustard, uh, must- that is, uh, yeah, amen. Okay. <laughs> So God loves to use the small things and turn them into great things. Yeah. He loves to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28 to 29. God shows the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. Come on. You know, we, there's no, no one in this room um, can boast before God. Right. God is the one that grows the kingdom. Yeah. And thank God because I'm such a sinner. All right, and, and I stopped the kingdom from moving. Okay, amen. Uh, am I talking about myself or am I talking about you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Even large ships are controlled by a tiny rudder. James chapter 3, verse 4. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. You've got to love the Bible. Or even a ravaging bushfire begins with a small spark. James 3 verse 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And so likewise, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, he, God can use that to ignite the world on fire. You know, just like the bamboo plant, okay? You know, we're talking about a mustard seed who's basically grown into this great plant in the garden, right? A bamboo plant, similarly, is a plant that grows to become great forests. You know, it grows very quickly, it grows from three feet, uh, it grows from uh, a seed into three feet in 24 hours. It releases 35% more, ox- percent more oxygen than hardwood forests of equivalent sizes. It does not require artificial fertilizers to grow. And they're also great for soil stability and erosion. So in case there's an earthquake in one of those Asian countries because of, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, tectonic activity, as a result of tsunamis, you know, people actually run into bamboo forests so that they can actually be safe from tsunamis. That's what they actually do. And in the same way, the kingdom is like a safe haven, a safe haven or a sanctuary for people that are fleeing from the world. They are stronger than steel and are used in scaffolding in Asian countries. They're actually a lot faster to, be, uh, to, 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 to create and a lot more stable than steel as well. If they actually fell, like a, a steel ca- scaffolding actually fell, it's actually very, very dangerous. But bamboo, less dangerous. You know, they also come in many different shapes and sizes and colors. Interesting enough. You know, we just had an uh, an incredible international day just last week. And uh, we got to see so many international uh, flavors. Uh, And I'm talking about the food. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and, uh, you know, in the same way, the kingdom of God is full of international people today. You know, in in the same way, an iPhone CPU, as small as it is in the iPhone, has the great power to be able to do so many great things with an iPhone, uh, with the camera and the, and the processor and so on. But point three, with the, the kingdom of God grows. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33 to 35. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will a lot of things hidden since the creation of the world. And so again, Jesus says that there's another parable for the kingdom. And it's like a woman who uses yeast to mix into flour and to dough it up. And as a result, it mixes throughout the whole dough and you're able to make great bread from it. You know, it's, it's, it's great to, uh, uh, in, the, in the kingdom, it was actually as a Christian that I learned how to make pizza for the very first time. 
And uh, pizza, we, you know, we did use a bit of yeast so that we can save time to actually... But it uh, basically quickens up the process of baking bread. And uh, you know, the reason why yeast uh, uh, is used in baking bread is because it actually adds a bit of... Uh, it actually adds a bit of... Uh, uh, a rise to the flour because it gives it more open and airy texture. It also gives it more strength too so that it doesn't just fall over. You know, so if you were a baker, this analogy would ob obviously really, really resonate with you. And so uh, I, I think about my favorite parables, you know, that help people to uh, become Christians and stay as a Christian. So a lot of you guys love coffee, right? Mm -hmm. So, my wife loves coffee and so do I, but the way that we make coffee is very, very different in the morning. So, I like to put milk into my cup and put it into the microwave for about a minute and a half and it's very instant. It, it, I got it from Joe, yeah, amen. <laughs> it's nice and quick, right? I don't have to clean anything and I just put it into the, uh, the espresso machine and it comes out. Very easy. But my wife loves to use the frothing machine, right? And she puts it in there, it froths it up, and it rises the milk. Whoa, yeah. And when she pours it into her espresso, it rises, uh, you know, like the, the parable that Jesus said. <laughs> you know, in the same way, it's like that, you know, it's like um, uh, the kingdom of God rises. The kingdom of God rises, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, amen. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think about how we got to learn how to look for what the truth is, especially if you're looking for a church and you're like, what, what, there's so many churches out there, I don't know which one to actually go to. Well, I used to work as a dealer in the casino, as a dealer in the casino. And what they teach us on how to actually understand what's fake and what's not fake, uh, uh, notes, cash, is to actually study the real thing. So they actually give you a real cash. They, they show you, they, they make you feel it, they make you smell it, they make you, you know, wave it in the air, they make you just do that as well. Like, what does it feel like? This is the real one. And so when you actually know what the real one is, when you're actually on the gaming floor, someone gives you a counterfeit note, you know instantly whether or not it's fake or not. In the same way, like when we're looking for the kingdom of God, We've got to be the ones that study what the truth is. And that comes from the Bible. You know, when we're studying the Bible, right? You know, it's like basically getting uh, uh, your, your rice washed through the water. You know, so for all my uh, fellow Chinese mates out there, you know, this one's for you. When you're washing rice, while well, you put it under water and you basically stir it in your, with your hands. You basically pour out the water. And what you realize about the water is that it becomes very, very cloudy. And that's because the starch from the rice is actually getting washed away so that you can actually have more delicious rice afterwards. That's why you have to wash your rice. So in the same way, your, our souls is like, when we're studying the Bible, is being washed through the Word. And sin comes out as a result. You know? And then I, I know that's a, I know this one's a favorite for Dune. Dune loves to play guitar, okay? You know, and it's a, it's a, you know, he loves to play guitar. He's taking his guitar everywhere. So for all you musicians out there, the church is like a guitar, all right? So you've got number of sp a, number, a number of strings. And if one string is untuned and you try to play the G chord, for instance, what is that going to sound like? Pretty bad, hey. So in the same way, if a Christian is just not tuned properly, and that's why we say the Bible, so that we can be all tuned properly, okay? We can all sound very harmonious in the church, amen. Um, and, and when you find the truth, when you find the truth, it's like having a eureka moment. So if, if you've ever been to Bathurst out in the country, right, and you're trying to pan for gold, and you find gold finally, you're like, Eureka! I, I learned that in school. Basically, what it means is, I found it. And in the same way, when a non-Christian finds the kingdom of God, which they're looking for, they're like, I found it. Eureka. You have a Eureka moment. So it's actually a really, really joyful thing to find what you're looking for, especially the kingdom. And angels are rejoicing in heaven as a result of people becoming Christians. That's like, you know, watching the state of origin and you're a Queensland supporter. Yeah! And your team wins. Man, there's a lot of rejoicing going on there, okay? And uh, once you surrender to the truth, it's like on a roller coaster ride. It's so fun. There are only two types of people on a roller coaster ride. There are people that are trying to hold on for dear life, 
And there's, a pe there's people that are just, I'm in for the ride, baby. And they put up their hands. And they're the ones that have the most fun. Yeah. You know, I think about, uh, you know, when we go to the beach and, uh, you know, we're having fun as Christians. And we're on the way home and then we basically try to pull out as much sand out of our pockets as much as we can, right? And uh, we always just find more sand, especially when you get home. It's like, where did this sand come from? Where did that sand come from? In the same way, like when we study the Bible and continually more and more, we realize that there's more and more sin in our hearts, yeah. right? And as a result, you know, we get to actually change so we can be more godly and be more like Jesus. And, uh, you know, when God stirs our souls, it's like putting Mentos in Diet Coke. There is an explosion that goes on. And how do we, uh, and, and you know, how, how does the kingdom grow? By you guys or evangelizing every single day and spreading the seed as much as possible. In the same way, when you're trying to grow your Instagram following, you need to keep posting content and creating stories. So the more you post, the more you give, the more you give, the more you give, there's more followers that come as a result. In conclusion, how does the kingdom of God grow? With natural power, with supernatural power, and with the power of parables. God is the greatest gardener and he's trying to plant his garden, which is going to be the greatest garden in the world, and that's the kingdom of God. And to leave you with a final analogy, I have something that I want to share with you. So, if you study soil long enough, you'll actually realize that soil in a single teaspoon has more microorganisms than people on the whole entire world. And that's all it takes for you to plant more and more and more. You might be able to meet someone that is going to change the world and eternity forever. And God be all the glory. Amen.